That's good. Hi, Javiera. How are you doing? Hi, Teo. How are you? I am doing really well. Congratulations on 770. Q50 so V47. That's amazing. And that's your second attempt over the course yes. of what? Your, your first attempt was in May, right? May time? Yes, like in May. Yeah. Half of May and then half of June. Okay, good. And you started preparing sometime in, in March, I would say, towards the end yes, of Yes, like February. at the beginning of March. Beginning of yeah. March. So March, April, May, two and a half months, you, you, you took your first test, go to, go to 710, and then another one and a half months, and you took your second test, right? So 770. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. How does it feel? <clears throat> I mean, I'm so relieved. <laughs> like when I saw the 770, I was so, so happy. Like I couldn't stop my smiling, like all the process actually was worth it. So I was really, really happy. Right. And it was all predictable, right? You were scoring that high in your official marks and Sigma X marks, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, yes. Before actually giving the 770, I had just done one like the day before and I got like the exact same score, like 770 with the exact same distribution. Absolutely wonderful. So tell me, how did you go about preparing for, for your test? Before that, let me ask mm -hmm. you a question. What is your background? You're from Santiago, chemical engineer by yes. profession. You've been, yeah, yes. So, so why don't you tell me about that? Yeah. Mm. So yes, I'm in Santiago. I was born here in Santiago. I've been living here all my life. I went into engineering. I got out of it in 2019. I got my degree. And then I've been in consulting for like the last two and something years. And um, well, I started preparing for the GMAT as we spoke in March uh, through eGMAT. Like that was the only like prep method I used. And um, yes, I, well, what I would do was like to prep, like every morning I would work, I would wake up like two hours before like my project started. So I would like do like my first two hours of the day, like some um, studying. I started okay. with the verbal section, then the quant. And then the weekends when I had like, when I had already done everything, mm -hmm. I started doing like Sigma mocks, mock um, tests in the, um, in the weekends, which I had like more time, like two and a half hours straight with no distractions to actually do them, like check all the answers afterwards. Okay. So let me share my screen and I'm going to show your uh, Sigma X mock result. So let's look at that real quick. So how you started so that, you know, we can go through... <clears throat> what you started off with and yeah, here you go. So end of Feb is when you took your first ever mock, you scored a 640 um, and your verbal was a lot stronger in this as compared to your quant. So if you look at yes. it, verbal was already at V39. And then I see that the reason for choosing EGMAT course, tell me that, why did you select the EGMAT course? <clears throat> A lot of my colleagues had recommended it because they had studied with it. And I just felt like I needed like a one-stop shop, like a, a place where I had everything that would help me know what to do. Cause like, I love the thing, like the planning and how there was like very, very straightforward method that told me every day what I had to do, what I had to learn um, without me having to take like the trouble of like planning, you know, it was, I had my personalized study plan, which mm -hmm. told me which contents I need to, I need to secure, like, where was I stronger? Where was I weaker? So like, it was really um, like an ease of mind to have like the program telling me exactly what to do and when, because like, I have a lot of like work. I have a very large like workload. So it's, it's very comfortable for me to have someone telling me how to move forward with this process without me having to take the time to plan. Perfect, perfect. So it seemed uh, from your first mock that verbal was your strength. So you started off with verbal, right? Now, yes. how did you, because you started off at a higher ability. So how did you use the course? And I would want to say one thing. You did not send us even a single email throughout the course of your preparation. The system itself told you what to do, what not to do, and you followed that to the letter T. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, it was really straightforward. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't like it's clearly explained. So mm -hmm. you didn't need to actually contact anyone. Like it's, it's very easy. What I did is like um, in the planning, it already said at what stage I was yes. in every like topic. And then there's a very 
explanatory video of what you should do in each st stage. Mm -hmm. So I, I would, in like some of them, I was already like stage three, which is like go straight to cementing. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that sure. I was like, maybe that like my first uh, attempt was kind of luck. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to still go through some concepts just mm -hmm. to make sure that I didn't go to like everything. I went mm -hmm. just to the pieces where I, I felt mm -hmm. that I was doing it kind of just because it, it felt right or it sounded right. right, but not because I had like a method really right. behind of it. Right. I think it really worked. Um, and I want to show, show one thing over here, your, your critical reasoning. And for example, here, assumption module, you went through the entire thing because this is where you're learning the content, right? You're learning the process. Right. So, so uh, that's a good segue. Tell me about the process that you used before um, before you started the EGMAT course to solve CR question, for example, in your mock, and then, uh, or, or even before that, and then what is the process that you used after for your attempts? Yeah, so before, I, I didn't really have like a process. I just would read the question, read all the alternatives, and just like go for the one that made more sense to me. But I wasn't doing it because I had like a standardized process to actually attempt the question. I was just doing it because I mean, it made sense. It, mm -hmm. it has to, but like there was, I didn't feel sure of the answers. I was like, um, like what I was selecting. I didn't know like, yes, for sure, this is it because I followed the steps, you know? Mm -hmm. And then with the EGMAT, what I was taught was all these steps, like the pre-thinking for the critical reasoning and how you go through the um, like uh, falsification condition and then actually uh, the process of elimination of alternatives. So I always, uh, what, what I really stick to in the critical reasoning, for example, for me, it was very important to actually read the statement first, then do my pre-thinking, come up with like some plus, some things that would strengthen or some things that would weaken my answer, depending mm -hmm. on the question, and then actually going through the alternative, selecting which one uh, was in line with my pre-thinking. And, and sometimes there wasn't, because like mm -hmm. sometimes you think other things and, and it's possible. But then I would go through the alternatives and like do my pre-thinking again with those kind of topics in mind, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I, that really helped me to feel more secure throughout the test, which I think it's like fundamental because like nerves are the thing they're gonna like, it's, it's the most important to be like calm when you're doing the test and mm -hmm. being sure like I'm doing good when you're going, like progressing. So you had a very robust thought process to approach each and every type of question and you brought CR as an example. So one thing that I do want to ask is, and students usually ask, how can I pre-think the exact answer? So as you rightly said, you don't necessarily have to pre-think the right answer. So what did pre-thinking do? Did it just help you understand the passage a bit more and so you were confident when you evaluated the answer choices? Yes, I mean, it, it, it happened to me at times that I did my pre-thinking pre and it wasn't in the alternatives. And I think it's valid because there's a lot of things that could like mm -hmm. weaken or strengthen certain clocks, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that with the pre-thinking, what you do is like you start, um, first of all, like you said, understanding very well the passage and start thinking of things um, that this passage is based on. And maybe mm -hmm. it's not the same that you thought but doing it definitely helps. So then when you read the alternatives, you already had given it a thought and it's not like you're mm -hmm. selecting the one that sounded better. Cause like mm -hmm. you now have a really good understanding of what things is this based on. And then what I always did was I like, I read the alternatives and kind of do the pre thinking again. Of course it's not pre thinking mm -hmm. because I already read mm -hmm. the alternatives but I kind of did the process again. Now having in mind the topics that appeared in the alternatives. In the so I would go, in the answer choices, yes. Mm -hmm. So I would go and think about it again before actually like selecting, right. like kind of like forcing myself to do this little pre-thinking again. Perfect, perfect. And one thing that you mentioned uh, during our pre-interview was that you, even if you found the correct choice, you would always make sure that you're eliminating all the incorrect answer choices, right? And that yeah. was very critical. And that's a very, um, that's a faltering point that I have experienced in my interactions with students that they would see the first thing that, 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 they, that seems to match and then they would select that as the correct answer and move on only to realize that what they ended up selecting was a trap answer choice and they fell for the trap, right? So that yeah, was Yeah, very... and the pre-thinking really helps in that sense because with the pre-thinking, you can eliminate some of the alternatives mm -hmm. very easily. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Another question, how long did it take for you to solve questions when you were do doing the course versus how did that timing change as you practiced? 
Yes, I think that was a huge change because when doing the course, like in the quiz, in the files, you kind of do the whole method. And that takes a lot of time. Like if you see the when the explanations, when you have, when you are like uh, checking the questions, it, it takes a lot of time. You have to see like, it's a five minute video mm -hmm. and you can, and I, it, the, when it was not timed, I kind of wanted to take all of that time that I needed to do the whole process to make sure like I was internalizing it. Mm -hmm. However, when I'm doing like a mock test or in the official GMAT, it's impossible to think that you will take more than two minutes in a question. Cause it's like, you're against the clock, the whole test. Mm -hmm. So what I think it's important is like to consolidate the method, like doing it the first times when you're practicing to really understand the method, really like internalize it. And then you can do it like quicker, you know, like I just read the, the passage, really fast do the pre-thinking think of one or two things that i or two to three things that i would think would weaken or strengthen and then go into the alternatives if it wasn't what i thought well then go to the ones that i can eliminate very quickly and the others kind of do the thinking again it was like a little bit like a faster version of the method but the method was still there you know it's just like you need to do it faster because you have like two minutes per question mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the amount of practice that you did in Scholaranium and the kind of variety of questions that you saw, all of that helped you hone in and bring in the time to answer questions, right? Because ultimately, yes, right? definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, the timing, it's it's the most important when you're doing the GMAT because like, mm -hmm. that's the main like, restriction you have. It's, right. I mean, if you had all the time in the world, you would probably get a lot more questions, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And that's what you did in cementing. And let me share my screen here and show your cementing stats. And you followed the cementing method to the letter T. And yeah, let me share <laughs> that. I, you know, when I see such accounts, I just feel so happy. <laughs> so yeah, um, you used almost about 50% of all the questions in verbal, right? And uh, if I look at your cementing here, medium, you didn't give up, you followed the process till the time you didn't get to at least two quizzes with uh, with your uh, with, with the score and here and look at the time. I mean, within two days, you finished your cementing and here also, let's take a look at that. Uh, you started on 5th March, uh, 7th March here and then here also 7th March. So you were following it exactly how it is, how it has been detailed out. And that wasn't just with with SC, CR also exactly same thing here. And again, the, the time over here, 17th March, 17th March. So walk me through, how long did you take? And uh, and I want to see what was 17th March, what day was it? So um, it was a Thursday. So you did three cementing quizzes on a single day. How Walk me through that study session, if you remember that. Again, I'm jogging yeah, your memory no, I, here. I remember because this was kind of an exception. Like I usually, most of my cementing, did it on the weekends on the because weekend. I had like, yeah, because I had more time, you know, like um, in the weeks I would usually like do the stuff. I, I would try to make it fit, you know, because sometimes you finish your, your segment that you're studying like on a Wednesday and it's like, I'm not going to miss all Thursday and Friday. But like, I tried to do more cementing on the weekend because you have a little bit more time for critical reasoning. I, I kind of like remember it very, um, Vividly, it, it was like I had good attempts from the beginning. I did. I wasn't having like bad attempts. I got mm -hmm. like over the threshold immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what happened is that those weeks I was uh, in between projects, so I had like a little bit more time, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I had. I, I mean, what what I was very conscious about was to like do the cementing quiz, then review what I had done wrong. I never did more like two cementing quiz quizzes on a row it. mm -hmm. because it's like. Exhausting. So I did like a couple of them, then I went away, did some other stuff, and then I de did the third one, for example, at night. And what okay. always happened to me, I was way better in the mornings than at night. <laughs> so you knew when is it that you are at, uh, at the highest of your abilities. Interesting. Yes. So, so you would do all of this revision. So what did you think about this review list? Did this help you figure out what it is that you need to review first, prioritize your review? Yeah, definitely. I would like... Because like, I mean, the ones that you got wrong, it's very clear that you mm -hmm. have to review, right? But then the ones that you took a little bit more time or like, for example, that one, it, it's good to review and kind of understand why did this happen? So what I would do, I, I would take a look at this, just like write down the numbers somewhere. And when I went through that question, still like do like a very thorough review, like the ones that I got right, 
I still looked at them just to remember if while I was doing this, I had any issues or maybe I wasn't really sure about an, uh, an answer choice. So I wanted to check it, but I, I, I focused my, my reviews on the ones that appeared in the list. Again, I'm smiling all along. No, I'm smiling all along because all the stuff that you're saying, that's what every student should do if they want to make <laughs> sure that they, they get to their target score in the right manner in the first first. I mean, I'm a very staunch believer of do things right the first time, especially if the process has been outlined for you. There is no reason why people have to take multiple attempts to get to their target score. And we'll come to why is it that you needed to take multiple attempts here, second attempt to get there. But all the stuff that you're doing, you did everything right. You you followed the, the process and, and very, very well. So I'm really happy to see that <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right okay so um you did cementing you followed this for rc as well i also want to show one thing over here and that's the consistency so um for and again this is something when i when i look at student accounts i mean if they have done the course well if they're following the process right then this hard in the last 20 hard accuracy i mean this these numbers are amazing typically the threshold is 50, 55 percent is that you are at 70th percentile for for a student to get to 90th percentile we, we say you need to have 70 percent accuracy and for you this is a number which is absolutely amazing and this is not just a point in time thing what i was absolutely amazed to see was the consistency that you had and that is a testament of how well you had imbibed the process and how well you were you were approaching every question. So here when I see, you know, consistently across all quizzes, and these are quizzes since first of June, and that's exactly the same thing if I do all data points. I mean consistent except for these little breaks here, you were about that was after my between my first and my second, I took like two or one and a half weeks of no study. And then I started again. So I started like a little bit ah. lower, but then I, I just got into it very fast. Another very important point. What do students do typically? They stop their prep. And I've, and I've, it's because I talk to people and, and I understand when they fail and when they succeed, I, I kind of can draw parallels that, okay, this is, if, if this is happening, then there is a reason why for that to, uh, but there is a very solid reason. In your case, as, as I mean, I could explain this dip, but you you did that really well that you know you you had not revised there was a gap in your preparation which is why it's always important to to revise before you take quizzes so absolutely wonderful and that and again your consistency shows i mean look at cr beautiful charts so that is what happens when you do stage one properly when you cement really well the consistency shows and that goes into your confidence which is what led you to get to your 770 right the confidence right so yeah. good um, walk me through your um, quant prep. How did quant go? It, you started off thinking it's your weaker section. Then what happened? Yeah. Yeah. I started off thinking like, I'm going to do really good in verbal and decent in quant. And then I'm going to get like a decent score. <laughs> that was what I thought. And then I just, because I hadn't done like math problems in such a long time. You know, I, I finished school in 2013. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in, in engineering, we saw a lot of math, but it wasn't like answer choices. It was like more complex calculus. So like mm -hmm. these more basic things, mm -hmm. I just felt like I had forgotten or probably not forgotten, but I wouldn't do it like so mm -hmm. like in one and a half minutes that you have. So I thought I, it was going to be really hard. Uh, but then actually going through the course, it was it just came to me really easily. So I would go through the um, explanations. There were some things, some tricks, especially that I didn't know. So it was really good to like incorporate those to like my daily life. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, such as what? There was uh, like, what for kind? example, all the divisibility rules. Okay. I knew a couple of them, but not all of them. There were, mm -hmm. a, and I loved that. Well, I mean, I love math. So maybe I'm kind of a nerd in that sense, but I love like the explanation behind them. Like I could, could really understand. Cause I just remembered, like, I don't know the one with three where you add up all the Some. digits. I kind of remembered that mm -hmm. from school, but I didn't know why. So now, like, I think I'm not going to forget, like, all the divisibility rules because so I really, you're... like, understood them. So what you're saying is that the course gave you the right conceptual understanding, and it wasn't just memorize this. It was why is it that this concept works? Yeah. Good. Okay. And, and, and I think that's really useful because not all the questions in some of the questions, you can use the same properties, like, in a different way. So if you really, like, understand them, it's easier. 
Mm-hmm. And I can see the amount of time that you've spent on this file. That that's amazing. Yeah. So, so this yeah. one, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Good. Go ahead. Hmm. I think it was uh, this one, like number properties, the one that I felt like more insecure uh, with. So mm-hmm. I, it was the one that I did like the most amount of quizzes. For example, then in probability, I didn't do a lot of them because I just felt uh, I got the initial quizzes. It was really good, so I didn't do. Mm-hmm. A lot more mm-hmm. but number properties I really felt like I didn't know um like the concepts behind so I kind of had to spend the time on it <laughs> number properties is a giant I, I would say number properties and algebra if you get these two courses right these two after yeah. quant basics and they set the foundation for everything else in um in in quant and I see that you used pace architecture so tell me uh, tell me more about it yes yeah I loved it. Like it was so good because of what we were talking at the beginning, like someone telling you you're okay with this. You don't need to like um, put your time into this. Just go put your time into something else. It was so good. It was so relieving because sometimes I felt like I already know this, but I'm not sure if I should skip this video or shouldn't like here. The pace um, tool was so good. I use it like thoroughly. If it said I shouldn't do something like I just didn't. And if it said I should, then I just did. And um, with math, what happened is that I was getting, um, I, I, I wanted to go like a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. So like number properties, I went really thoroughly. And the other ones, I think I went like, yeah. I skipped a little bit more, mm-hmm. but um, always making sure to do the cement thing. Cause like, I, yes. I felt like if I did the cement thing and if it was good, like then I could just move on. Yes, absolutely. And cementing again, wonderful. The way your, um, the verb, yeah. So again, so you followed the exact same thing. So which was again very, very pleasant. I was very, very happy to see your account. <laughs> so, and and your uh, your again your uh, skill data also shows the same similar kind of progression here, which again reflects your Q50. So very very good and across everything, not just a single subsection. The consistency is what makes a huge difference, and that is what shows up in your Sigma X mock as well. So now tell me about, um, okay, before we go into mocks, you only did EGMAT course and you did official guide, right? So what yes. was the intent behind doing official guide? Um, you mean for the official guide? I usually used it to practice when I failed um, a cementing quiz. Mm-hmm. So I would I, I followed all the method. Like I would do the cementing quiz. If I failed it, I would go into relaxed timing. And mm-hmm. then if I failed that, I would go into the official guide and do, I don't know, 20, 30 exercises until uh-huh. I felt like I was doing this like um okay. Faster, I was going to show know? the cementing process here, but your account is obviously <laughs> locked. So, yeah, never mind. That's okay. Yeah, so here we have a detailed flow chart in which we show you if you fail, take this quiz. If you fail this, then go and do official guide practice. Okay, that's what I was going to show. Okay, all right, go ahead. So I you... did a lot of that with the official guide. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I only did, yeah, as we were talking about, I, I only did eGMAT and then the official MBA.com exams. Okay. Did you ever feel that the questions in the course were not reflective of what you would see in the official guide or what did you think? I felt like the official guide was a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I I felt like eGMAT was like if I could do eGMAT in the correct time. I mean, I don't know if they were harder, but maybe they were like a little bit more time consuming. So I, I think it was a really good practice for me because if I can manage to do this that is a little bit more time consuming, then I felt way more relaxed on the GMAT. I, and I feel, I don't know if it's true, maybe it's the nerves of the exam, but like I felt like eGMAT was a little bit harder. And then the official guide and the exams on the MBA.com were like a little bit easier. And the GMAT was like somewhere in between these two. So it was actually really good to practice with both of them. Um, But the kind of question, it was really similar. Like after a while, I I did a lot of quizzes in eGMAT. So you kind of get like, there are X type of questions and and you start getting them and you've solved so many of them that you see it and you're, you know, at least, somewhere where this is leading like maybe you don't know exactly where what you have to do but you know what's the path to follow Mm -hmm. and that was exactly the same 
Like okay. in the GMAT, it was exactly the same. You would get a question and you would know because of all the practice where this is leading to. I just felt they were like a bit less time consuming, which was good. Like mm -hmm. it was like with the Sigma mock tests, I always finished like very, very tight on time. Sometimes I, I actually didn't have time to do like the 31st or 30th mm -hmm. question on the quant mm -hmm. side. And with GMAT on my 770, actually, I got like five minutes to spare. And that is by design. You know, because when you're taking a Sigma yeah. mock, you don't have that pressure of, oh, this is my final attempt. This is the make or break thing. So in order to incorporate that part, you know, there are certain things, of which is what was, it is by design that, you know, you have the same principles that are tested on the official, uh, on, on the questions, but you add slight complexity, which is not going to be out of the blue. I mean, it, it, those are complexities which would be tested, let's say, in certain other questions, which is why we do a very thorough review of each and every official question. And then we see, okay, what is typically tested? If there are four questions, certain, and, and let's say they, they have complexities on, let's say, three different vectors, then you, you know, combine those, those complexities and then you yeah. create your question so yeah okay good I'm, I'm glad um let's look at your mock scores and let me share my screen once again because that is a very interesting thing so tell me what happened where was the official mock uh, official test um, that you took yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so i did okay so i got the 750 the 24th of april mm -hmm. that, that the one in the middle mm -hmm. And then I did the official like MBA.com um, um, mock tests and I got like, I don't know, 760, 770 of those. Mm -hmm. I did my first attempt at the GMAT, which was, which was my 710. And what I felt like is that I had done all these mock tests in which in all of them, I had gotten more than 710. So I kind of knew um, it was more of a problem of like feeling secure and I was like very nervous. I had kind of some problems logging in. So it, it was kind of a stressful situation. And I think that though that stress kind of distracted me and you need to be very focused on the GMAT. So, and actually um, on math, on the quant side, I did like a little bit worse, but on the verbal side, I did significantly worse than I had done on, on my mm -hmm. other mocks. And I know that verbal is my strength. So I mm -hmm. feel like when I was reading, I was kind of distracted. I couldn't really focus. So I decided to take the GMAT test again, because mm -hmm. I knew like with all of my previous mock tests, with my performance, like I knew I could get like a higher score with not that much effort, like that much additional effort. Like I knew like if I study like, very focused like I don't know it was like a month between both of them and I just study like very focused and uh, put in the time and just try to call myself like the second time you give it you know what you're dealing with it, it's different mm -hmm. so then I got like I did the mock test that I had uh, left I, I took a week between after the gym and I was like I'm just gonna take a week off thinking this because I, I really need to relax and then I started again so then I got again a 7.30 and then again a 7.50 mm -hmm. and I went to the official MBA.com mm -hmm. um, prep tests and I got the 7.70 and then I got the 7.70 on the official. Perfect, test. perfect. I also want to show the kind of quizzes that you took between these two attempts. And that is... Yeah, a lot. Very, yeah, yeah, tell me, tell me about that. Yeah. So it's around... Yeah, because like, this, yeah. I already... Yeah, because I had already done uh, the... Um, like all the conceptual things, mm -hmm. but I wanted to practice, you know, because like practice makes perfect. And mm -hmm. and with GMAT, that's like the timing thing and knowing the kind of questions. So what I would do is like every day, depending on how, how much I time I had, I would do like a 15 questions for mm -hmm. verbal and 15 questions for quant. I would combine all the topics. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted like a, all of the things together and all of my unanswered questions. And I would mm -hmm. just like, do them and, and then check them again. And I would do always medium hard and sometimes only hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that I would make sure that I was like stressing myself to the point in which I am answering only hard questions, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I would practice a lot with, with that. And then if I identified that I was having like certain flaws, like repeated flaws on certain kind of questions, mm -hmm. I would go again to like the topics. It happened, for example, with um, um, the Venn diagrams in, in quant, mm -hmm. that I was getting them wrong or I was getting them with a lot of like, mm -hmm. I was taking a lot of time 
in doing those. So I just went back and watched a couple of videos again, okay. did some like the practicing again. But it was mostly like these combined quizzes to just like help me like gain the stamina you need for the for the mm -hmm. for the team. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Very nice. Um, I would say, Javier, I mean, very, very structured process of, of preparing and the way, and again, course is one thing, course, course gives you that, that structure, but it's you who has to follow along and, and put in the hard work. I mean, the kind of thought process that went into ensuring that if you're failing in cementing, how is it that you should be bridging those gaps? Or if you are not, or, or you know, reviewing the analytics and making sure that you are bridging those gaps. I mean, all of that is completely you. I mean, we provided the course, but you're the one who used it the, in, in, in the right manner, which is what I say, you know, course is there, the same course is used by people who are successful like you and people who are not able to get there, right? It's you who makes the difference. So uh, wonderful, congratulations on that. And I would say this goes back into the entire journey that you've had so far. I mean, BCG right after college, and then two, within two years, you've, uh, you've gotten promoted from an associate to a consultant and you jumped a year there. So congratulations for that. And now you are targeting those uh, M7 schools and there's, I have no doubt in my head that you're going to do really, really well. So uh, all the very best for your preparation. So toward the end, I just want to ask you, if you were to say three things that potential GMAT aspirants should incorporate in their study, what would those be? First of all, and I think the most important is consistency. Like I, I never skipped a day or, or maybe one day, but not more than that. Like I would log in every day even the weekends when i was tired like i think consistency is key because you're learning and you need to like do that like pro learning progression every day mm -hmm. the second one um i would think it's it's maybe just like trust like trust that you will get there because like at the beginning it seems like so far away and so hard and then you start looking at the things you get wrong and it's not like you can't solve it it's it was it's it's the tiny details so I guess like it's a lot of like doing the work trusting that you will get there and well I don't know I think it's it's just those two things maybe um maybe like maybe like taking like trying to leave the pressure out of it like I know it's it's hard but like just try try to live the process with with no pressures like if you don't feel ready to take the gmat that's perfectly fine if you thought it was going to take two months and then it takes three or or maybe if you need like a little bit more time to study i think it, it's it's okay just mm -hmm. like live the live the process as pressureless as you can be understanding that it's a very stressful process absolutely amazing the last i mean consistency very good trust trusting in yourself that is a very important learning pressure i know it took you a little bit of time to get there but that i believe is the most important thing and if you're doing mm -hmm. one and two if you are being consistent and if you trust yourself and the and the way you are going about your gmat prep i think relieving that pressure is the is the easiest thing to do but that is one yeah. thing that people don't do they let the you know the the pressure of the test kill their preparation. So very valid points. All right, Javier, thank you so much for this. I'm sure the GMAT aspirants who are going to watch this video, they are going to learn a lot. I mean, you're very, very motivating story. So absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye, Bail. Thank you. Bye-bye.